Hello, I'm Dr. Laura Murillo, President and CEO of the Houston Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. On behalf of our Board of Directors, we want to thank you for joining us today, and we want to wish you a very happy 2021. It's a year that I know we will see a lot of great news for our region and to talk about some of that great news as it relates to businesses, the PPP loans. We have three invited guests who are going to give you updates. They include none other than our Congresswoman who will begin with, uh, representatives from the world of accounting, SBA as well. So thank you for joining us. We'll begin our conversation again. As many of you know, PPP loans were made available. Many of you applied for those through your banks with the support and assistance of lawyers and accountants. Others of you unfortunately did not do so. Your Houston Hispanic Chamber of Commerce has been working closely with local banks and other leaders in the region, ensuring that information is provided to you to make it easy for you to apply. Please do so visit our website as we have other resources available. From Briggs and Veselka, joining us is Sheila Enriquez, and she's CEO of Briggs and Veselka and is doing a phenomenal job of making sure they provide resources as well. You'll hear from her shortly. Also joining us is Timothy Jeffcoat with the SBA, who has been a great partner to the Houston Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, and they have a plethora of resources, so you'll hear from them. So let's start with our Congresswoman, Lizzie Fletcher. Hello, Congresswoman. Good morning, Dr. Murillo. Great to see you. Likewise, well, you have had a busy day. We're off to a new year with a new administration, lots of work to be done, but specifically, if you could talk to us about PPP and this second round, some words from your um, group out there in Washington, DC, and what people should know. Well, thanks so much, Dr. Mario. I am glad to say um, that we have good news on the PPP front. This has been an issue that has been a constant since we first passed the program last year. I've heard from so many constituents, so many small businesses across the 7th Congressional District and throughout the, the greater Houston region um, who really need this assistance. And what we have seen, and I'm sure uh, some of my colleagues here on the call can talk to this a little bit more, but we've had more than 26,000 loans to constituents, constituents in Texas' 7th Congressional District alone, more than 80% of which were less than $150,000 really essential funds to keep businesses operating. And one of the challenges was that that program expired last year. So I was very pleased that at the end of the year um, that Congress passed HR 133, it's our consolidated appropriations bill, um, and that extended and modified the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, and it also funded the economic injury grant uh, and created a new program for, it's a shuttered venue grant program. We heard from so many uh, people who operated venues, um, performance venues who weren't eligible for PPP loans. So um, it did a couple of really important things. I'll just mention it reopened the PPP loan period through March 31st of this year um, with more than $284 billion in funding. It allows, importantly, for a second draw for businesses with less than 300 employees and revenue loss of at least 25% who've already used or will use their initial PPP loans. And that's so important. We heard from so many people who said they, we anticipated the, the impacts of the pandemic might not last this long, but many businesses still feel that the worst impacts are yet to come and they need access to that money. Um, in addition, uh, we set aside $15 billion for first time PPP applicants. Um, and that's very important for small business borrowers that have 10 or fewer employees um, and who are located in low to moderate income areas, making sure that everyone uh, has access to these funds, which was uh, an issue very early on in the program. And one other thing I just wanna mention, there's obviously a lot to cover, but um, it also expanded the use of PPP funds in this latest round of legislation to allow for the kinds of expenses that businesses are incurring as a result of the pandemic uh, that, weren't, that didn't qualify the first time around. So funds for PPE, uh, funds for investments to help business owners comply with health and safety guidelines, uh, operating expenditures uh, for things that were unanticipated. Those can all now be included. And so I think it's really important uh, to see the extent of this. And of course, um, as you have heard from uh, now President uh, Biden, uh, that continuing to address the, the economic impacts of the pandemic is a top priority for the new Biden administration 
as it is for this Congress. So I expect additional work in these first few months, knowing that this program will expire um, at the end of March of this year. But I do think Congress will continue to work on this. And so I encourage everyone uh, to connect with uh, everyone on this panel and also to reach out to my office for any um, additional things that they might be interested in in uh, seeing in the PPP program or in economic assistance. Yes, a lot of information for folks who are in the region. Reach out to your Congress people. They have information on their websites. They are taking your phone calls. Please get information and you have to really move on this very quickly. As we know, these funds are limited. They won't be here forever. So take advantage of it. But you might be watching and thinking that it's too complicated and maybe you're not sure whether or not you qualify. There's a lot of support out there, especially beginning with the uh, Small Business Administration. Tim, thank you so much for always being by our side to provide accurate and detailed information. So let's start with uh, just your take on the second round of PPP and some insight from you. Sure. Second round of PPP is already very fast. Um, just this morning in the Houston Business Journal, there was an article that highlighted the thousands of applications that have already occurred with some of the local banks. But it's a great opportunity whether you participated in PPP the first time it was available or whether you're now thinking about it, there are still opportunities for your business to get it. Um, if it's a first time PPP, it's up to $10 million depending on the size of your business and your payroll. And for a second draw PPP, it's up to $2 million also depending on the size of your payroll. Well, and on that note, speaking of first draw, second draw, some folks are still hoping that some of these will be forgivable. Any insight on that, whether it's from you or the Congresswoman on, on any conversations regarding that? Sure, both of these loans have similar parameters. They're basically the same thing with a few minor differences, such as the amount, the possible amount of the loan that I mentioned. But fundamentally, there are three things you've got to do. When you get this loan, Again, it's the Paycheck Protection Program. So 60 alone is intended to be used for paychecks. And keep in mind, that's going to be the folks that you pay with a W-2, not 1099s. Those we look at and the IRS look at as independent contractors so they can get their own PPP. But for forgiveness, 60% or more needs to be spent on paychecks and then 40% or less is spent on some of the other eligible expenses that Congresswoman Fletcher just mentioned. So rent, mortgage interest, utilities, there's a, a, a small range of operating expenses, personal protective equipment expenses. And uh, if you've been, uh, well, if you've had some civil disturbance around your business and it's damaged and insurance won't cover it, then this can cover that as well. But as long as you spend those two ways, 60% for paychecks 40 or more, 40% or less for these other expenses. And there's one more thing, you need to ensure that you're paying your folks at least 75% of what you used to pay them in terms of either wages or hours. Those are the three keys. If you do those, you should be able to get 100% forgiveness. It's worth noting that my office does a range of webinars to help small businesses every week, up to 30 webinars a week. Um, but we definitely do webinars both on getting these PPP loans and getting forgiveness. They're different webinars. Uh, the gentleman that does our forgiveness webinar is Winston LeBay, has studied it in and uh, everything there is to know about forgiveness, I believe he knows. So those that participate in his webinars will get detailed looks at each form that can be used. There's a very simple one that's just one page long. And then there's one that's a bit more versatile, I'll say, not complex, that will be to look at forgiveness from a lot of different angles, maximum forgiveness for your business. So those are really highly valuable webinars. Yes, and we know that a lot of that information is available, so don't be shy. Get on those websites, look for information, go to the Chamber website, the Houston Hispanic Chamber of Commerce website. We have information there in English and in Spanish. I will say, Tim, that it is important to note that, of course, there's never fails that they'd be people out there who are trying to take advantage of the system, whether it is to file uh, for businesses they don't have or to charge people for this service and Actually, it's not even helping folks apply for the grant and the loans. Can you talk to us about that and some safety precautions small businesses can take? Yeah, once you 
So when you're pursuing a PP loan, you're going to be working with one of the banks here in the Houston area. Um, there are about 150 or so that normally engage in SBA lending, and there are actually several hundred more that are currently working just to do PPP loans. One of the things you can do is go to the SBA's website in Houston. If you just wanted to Google SBA Houston, we should be the first hit. And on that website will be a list of these banks. If you're looking for a PPP loan, I would encourage you to go find that list, choose a bank on there that looks good to you. It's probably the one you're already working with and talk to them. Once you start talking to them about your PPP loan, then you will be corresponding back and forth with them and you should never get anything from the SBA. The entire loan is going to be coming directly from that bank and then they in turn engage with the SBA. So if you started receiving emails with an SBA logo on it, asking for social security numbers or passwords or things of that nature, realize that the SBA is not gonna ask you any of that information in relation to a PPP. That's all gonna happen directly with your banker. So be aware of that. There is the economic injury disaster loan, which it really isn't in the scope of what we were talking about this morning, but the economic injury disaster loan comes directly from the SBA. That's a little bit of a different situation. There you will get lots of emails from SBA, but with a PPP, that would be highly unusual. So again, be very careful. Make sure you're uh, going to known sites. Uh, don't click into any other sites or provide social security or any other type of information. Be very, very careful. We encourage you to work with those banks where you may have a relationship and or your accountant. And so on that note, we're going to shift over to our friends over at Briggs and Veselka. Sheila, talk to us a little bit about some of the things that you want to make sure small businesses are aware of. Yes, Dr. Merlo, thank you so much. And um, I know most of the information that Congressman Fletcher and Mr. Jeff Goat had covered had really um, touched on the, the major points of the PPP, especially the PPP, we call them the PPP2, the second draw. But one of the things I did want to emphasize is for your viewers and listeners to reach out you know, to their CPAs, to their bankers, because um, it can tend to become complex on its face, but with advisors helping you, it really isn't that, you know, that difficult to be able to assess your eligibility and your application. And so we ourselves, our CPA firm, we have put out webinars also on a regular basis. We make it available on our website. There are a lot of resources out there that your viewers and listeners can go to. And um, there are just a couple of things that I wanted to highlight that um, maybe just additional information that would help your, your listeners. So in, for, for the um, second draw of the PPP, additional eligible entities were added. So now 501c6 entities, for instance, such as Chamber of Commerce, housing cooperatives and some news and marketing organizations are now part of the eligible entities. I also wanted to highlight that um, the, the goal really for the second draw, which is um, a, a great way of, of helping our, our most um, in need industries, they have also differentiated the hospitality industry uh, and accommodations. And whereas the, the for most borrowers, two and a half times payroll is the maximum for those in the um, NAICS code 72, which is your accommodations and hospitality, it is three and a half times their 2019 um, payroll. And so that really is an intention to help the hardest hit industries. And I know as well, there is a huge effort to reach out to small businesses and, and minority um, owned businesses, which is really um, a good way of allowing them to take advantage of this opportunity they may have missed out on the first time. So time is of the essence. And you know, I just encourage everyone to reach out to your um, advisors, to your bankers. And again, the SBA has been a tremendous resource with giving out relevant information on a timely basis. And so you're not alone. And we know that many folks watching us have multiple businesses. And so again, for each of them, correct, Tim, you've got to set those up individually. Is that correct? Yeah, the, the differentiator generally will be if they have individual EINs, employer identification numbers. And if they do, then they tend to be treated as separate businesses. So each of those businesses, if they should stand alone legally, and if they do, 
then they can be treated as separate, uh, separate, lend, uh, separate borrowers. Uh, Tim, could you talk to us a little bit about some of the things that businesses should have in place as they are contemplating applying for the PPP loan? What are some of the basic things they're going to need? And so that this way, if they don't have these things, perhaps they don't go through all of the rest of the application. Sure. Well, the number one thing, first off, the application itself is really pretty straightforward. You're mainly identifying who you are and asserting that you really do need this money and you're going to spend it the way that we've asked you to spend it. That's most of the form. The key things that you need to apply to calculate the amount of your loan is you need to know your average monthly payroll for the 12 months prior to applying the, to the loan. So let's say you were going to go today and apply at the lender of your choice, then you would want to know your average monthly payroll for the previous 12 months. Now, as uh, Sheila said, and by the way, it was really good. You covered several things I forgot. But uh, as Sheila said, you're going to take that number, multiply it by 2.5, and that's the amount of your loan. A really important point, if you are a sole proprietor or if you are an independent contractor, it doesn't always work out great for you because in some cases, those independent contractors or proprietors, what is called your payroll to the IRS is your net profit. So that would be line 31 on your 1040 tax form. Um, in many cases, because of a lot of expenses you might have with your business, your actual net profit is pretty small but you're still gonna be taking that number, multiplying it by 12, I mean, dividing it by 12 and multiplying by 2.5, and the result might be a very small number. So in those cases, there are other programs that may be able to help you. PPP may not be the best choice because it's just you and the IRS views your payroll as your net profit. But uh, also, as Sheila mentioned, if you're looking at the second draw, you do exactly the same thing. You want to know your previous 12 months average monthly payroll. And for those NAICS code 72 firms, hotels and restaurants predominantly, um, it's a 3.5 time multiple. But as long as you have that handy, you're pretty much ready to go. And we know that uh, unfortunately, especially the underserved communities, probably and possibly we know do not have a bank affiliation or relationship with a banker and possibly not even an accountant. What's your recommendations, either of you, Sheila or, or Timothy? I was just going to say, um, and maybe we can get more specific from my co-panelists as well, but I think you brought up such an important point, Dr. Murillo. When the PPP program was first established, it was more difficult for underserved communities to have access to these funds. Um, and that's a hallmark of, um, unfortunately, the, the system that has shown it's traditionally been more difficult uh, for some of these underserved communities to have access to capital in general. It's something that um, Congress has been very focused on and we've been talking about since very early on uh, with the program. You saw that um, as something that was negotiated with the initial uh, reauthorization of PPP back in the spring, and it continues to be a high priority for Congress. So I just want to make sure um, that that is uh, that that everyone knows how important it is and how much we are talking about that. Um, and I've worked with my colleagues on this issue for many months. Uh, we called on the negotiators to make sure that underserved communities were not left behind. And in the new bill, um, we have gotten to the heart of the issue by reserving $15 billion set aside for first time borrowers with 10 or fewer employees for small loans in low income areas. Um, additionally, uh, Tim was mentioning earlier that forgiveness and there's a simplified forgiveness for loans under $150,000 that eliminates a lot of the administrative burden on some of the smallest businesses. Um, it also requires that the SBA submit government oversight of the loans and testify to Congress regularly so that we can closely monitor the effectiveness of this program and also that through this and other programs, we can get at the heart of some of these disparities that we have seen, not just in this program, but in general. So I just wanna emphasize what a priority that, that is and has been. It's such an important point that you raised. Um, and I'm, I'm sure my other panelists have um, additional information that would be helpful here too. Sheila, from your perspective? Yeah, as I was just about to say, Dr. Morello, even for the small businesses that maybe only have a um, checking account, you know, with a bank, it's important for them to reach out because banks are really 
in, a, in, a, in an effort to, to help their clients are, are being educated, you know, with, with the PPP. In fact, a lot of community banks have also stepped in. And I know a lot of our clients, for instance, that didn't have access with the larger banks. So many of them had to wait or had to kind of um, didn't have access because the banks themselves had shut down their applications during the PPP one process. We're able, we were able to connect them with community banks that were immediately able to assist. And so, um, when it comes to their advisors for businesses that have their tax returns prepared, I, they I would start, you know, with their CPA and start with their accountants and be able to connect them with a network of um, support that can help them through that process. Well, a lot of information, but again, I think it's very important to emphasize if you are a small business, this absolutely is for you. We know that through the first PPP, many people didn't even try. If you were one of those people, we encourage you to do so. We know that the bankers and the banks are working overtime trying to fill all of these requests and will help walk you through those applications. I'd like to go back uh, before we wrap up the program. And Tim, any closing remarks on behalf of the SBA? Yeah, just a couple. Um, first, if you don't have a bank and you're looking for one, please visit our website, SBA Houston. And again, there's a list there of over, I think it's around 200 local banks. Many of those are community banks that can help you through the process. The other thing is that the SBA has already paid on your behalf about 250 free advisors and mentors here in the Houston area. So if your business needs some help figuring out how to go into this process, no problem. The Texas Gulf Coast Small Business Development Centers can help you. The SCORE organization can help you. And then the WBEA Women's Business Center can also help you. And we're proud to just uh, recently announced a second women's business in here in Houston affiliated with the Greater Houston Women's Chamber of Commerce. So all four of those organizations can help at no charge. Now they're not gonna take the place of a CPA. They're gonna coach you through the process. They won't actually do the work for you. Whereas if you're working with a CPA, I totally agree with Sheila, go to that CPA and let them help you uh, get ready to go apply for the loan. But those are the main things that I would leave everybody with, knowing that you can find a good bank listed on our website in Houston, and we have free resources available for your business. It does not have to be your bank. So feel free to shop around, if you will, and find those that can best support uh, the needs that you have. And also, we know that uh, not only that, but as mentioned on the SBA website and the Chamber website, there are resources that we've already vetted that are solid resources for you. So get out there, get that information. I want to end the program with our Congresswoman and perhaps uh, ask you to uh, give some hope to these small businesses. We know that in Houston, uh, many businesses have closed and uh, this is not a temporary situation for them. They are closed forever. Uh, we know that Congress uh, is going to be working hard and, and the delegation from Houston is going to be working hard, not only to bring the financial resources, but also to improve the economy. We know that among the Hispanic community, specifically the numbers nationwide in terms of unemployment are up to 20% among Hispanics, significantly higher than the rest of the population. So on PPP, on jobs and the economy, what hope, Congresswoman, can you provide to this community? Well, thank you so much, Dr. Murillo, for the question. And I would say that right now I am very hopeful and optimistic because I see the resolve of the members of Congress who are working every day to address these challenges. As you, uh, I'm sure know, and, and as I mentioned earlier, so much of what we've done comes from hearing directly from our constituents. So the first thing I would say uh, that's so important is to recognize that there are so many people here to help you and to help your business get through this very challenging time. I think everyone here has talked about the resources they have. And certainly uh, I have resources available on my website um, and I have people in my office who are here to help uh, business owners and constituents throughout our community. Um, but it is not simply um, on a one-to-one -one basis, but on a really a national basis, we have got to get our arms around addressing this pandemic and the challenges that have caused so many businesses 
to uh, to be in this financial situation, um, the limitations on our interactions. So I am very hopeful and optimistic that what we've seen immediately from the new Biden administration supported by the Congress is an effort to prioritize addressing the root cause of these challenges for us, which is the coronavirus pandemic, to roll out a massive vaccination program to get people vaccinated across the country and to crush the virus. That is step one, but we also know that we have to address the effects of it while we are still experiencing it. So what I see is a true commitment from our Houston delegation, my colleagues in Houston, we talk about what we can do all the time to make sure that all communities across the greater Houston region and across the country are getting the help that they need. And I would just like to close with um, a great point that you raised. I'm not sure people realize that how much um, of our agenda is shaped by hearing from our constituents. And there were some important bills that we worked on in the last Congress that unfortunately did not pass. Um, I worked on one that was born in, in the Houston community with small business owners in Houston, the Lift Up Act, to try to get assistance to people who already had disaster loans, like people who are still paying off Harvey loans. Um, and we're gonna reintroduce that in this Congress. Uh, the Restaurants Act, some people also fo followed to help uh, restaurants, while it didn't pass exactly, so many of these ideas come directly from constituents. So what I want people to know is both that people are working on it, but also that we want to hear from them about their experiences so that we can solve their problems. That's what we're here for. It's a privilege to be able to do it. And I appreciate the chance to visit with you this morning about it and look forward to continuing our work together to address these, these challenges facing our community. Well, we'd like to thank you, Congresswoman, and all of our guests today for joining us. Please visit the Houston Hispanic Chamber of Commerce website. Follow us on social media. On behalf of the Houston Hispanic Chamber of Commerce board and staff, we thank you for joining us. I'm Dr. Laura Murillo, President and CEO. We'll see you real soon. Thanks to all of our guests. Bye-bye.